In the early 1960s, a University of Utah engineering student named Nolan Bushnell lost his tuition money in a poker game. He immediately took a job at a pinball arcade near Salt Lake City to make back his money he desperately needed for himself and for school. Bushnell was currently majoring in engineering, and he had access to the school computers. So what did Bushnell play on the computers? It was Space Horror, a very addicting game that every college student was enjoying at the time. A lot of the students just saw it as a game, but Bushnell saw the game as a way to make some money. His idea was to put a game like Space War into a pinball machine arcade. He figured that people would line up to play it. Bushnell graduated from college in 1968 and moved on to California. He wanted to work for Disney, but they turned him down. So he took a day job with an engineering company called Ampex. He worked during the days and spent the rest of his nights building his arcade video game with very little sleep. Bushnell was extremely invested into building his arcade video game. He converted his daughter's bedroom into a workshop. He searched around at his daytime job at Ampex for free parts. Bushnell kept asking his friends at other tech companies for spare parts. Bushnell got an old black and white TV monitor at Goodwill and also bought an old paint center can to make a coin box. When the prototype game was completed, he called it Computer Space. All Bushnell needed to do was find a partner to help him manufacture and sell it. Bushnell got advice from his dentist. He made a deal with the manufacturer of arcade games, Nutting Associates. Nutting agreed to build and sell the games in exchange for a share of the profits. In return, Bushnell signed on as an engineer for the firm. If you never heard of Computer Space, you aren't alone. The game was a complete failure. The game concept sounded simple. You basically control a rocket, and the mission was to destroy two alien flying saucers powered by the computer, but it came with several pages of difficult to understand instructions. The fact that it was the world's first arcade video game only made things worse. Neither players nor arcade owners knew what to think of the strange machine sitting next to the pinball machines. People still couldn't grasp the concept of a TV set in a box with a coin slot to play games on it. Bushnell was in denial. He blamed the nutting associates instead of the game itself. Bushnell was convinced that he could do a better job running his own company. So Bushnell and his friend chipped in $250 a piece to start a company called Syzygy. The name Syzygy simply means the configuration of the sun, the earth, and the moon when in a straight line in space. That's what Bushnell wanted to name it, but when he filed with the state of California, they told him the name was already taken. Bushnell liked to play Go, a Japanese game of strategy similar to chess. He saw some of the words used in the game would make a good name for a business, and the company legend has it that he asked the clerk of California Secretary of State's office to choose between Sente, Hain, and Atari. She picked Atari. Bushnell hired an engineer named Al Alcorn to develop games. Meanwhile, Bushnell installed pinball machines in several local businesses, including a bar called Andy Capps Tavern. The cash generated by the pinball machines would help fund the company until the video games were ready for the market. Alcorn's first assignment was to build a simple ping pong style video game. Bushnell told him that Atari had signed a contract to deliver such a game to General Electric and now it needed to get built. According to the official version of events, Bushnell wanted Alcorn to get used to designing games and wanted him to start out with something simple, ping pong with one ball and two paddles was about as simple as a video game can be. In reality, there was no contract with GE and Bushnell had no intention of bringing a table tennis game to the market. He was so convinced that the biggest money makers would be complicated games like Computer Space. Alcorn had to give a convincing argument to Bushnell to keep going with the table tennis game. Instead of a simple game, Alcorn's ping pong had a touch of realism. If you hit a ball with the center of the paddle, the ball bounced straight ahead. But if you hit the ball with the edge of a paddle, it bounced off at an angle. With Alcorn's enhancements, video ping pong was a lot more fun to play than Bushnell had expected. As long as the game was fun, Bushnell decided to test it commercially by installing Pong, as he decided to call it, at Andy Capps Tavern. Two weeks later, the owner of Andy Capps called to complain that the game was already broken. Alcorn went out to fix it, and as soon as he opened the machine, he realized what was wrong. The game was full of quarters. It had overflowed the coin tray and jammed the machine. That was only half the story. The bar's owner also told Alcorn that on some mornings when he arrived to open up the bar, people were already waiting outside. 
but they weren't waiting for beer. They come in, play Pong for a while, and then they leave without even ordering a drink. You never seen anything like it. That was their indication that Pong was going to be a hit. But did Nolan Bushnell really come with the idea for Pong, or did he lift it from another video game company? Video game history buffs still debate this very issue today. Here's what we know so far. In the 1960s, a defense industry engineer named Ralph Baer invented a video game system that could be played at home on a regular television. The system featured 12 different games, including table tennis. Magnavox licensed Bear's system in 1971 and prepared to market it as Odyssey, the world's first home video game system. The company planned to sell the system through its own network of dealers and distributors. In May of 1972, the company quietly began demonstrating the product around the country, and on May 24th, it demonstrated at a trade show in Burlingame, California. In later litigation, Stephen Kent writes in The Ultimate History of Video Games, it was revealed that Bushnell not only attended the Berlin Game Show, but also played tennis game on Odyssey. But there are some unanswered questions. Did Bushnell have a revelation when he played the Odyssey game? Did it convince him that simple games like Pong would be more popular than complicated games like Space Force? Or was it just as he claimed that he instructed Alcorn to invent a ping pong game, perhaps inspired by the Magnavox Odyssey, only because it was the simplest one he could think of? We'll probably never know for sure. As far as the law is concerned, the only thing that really mattered was that, unlike William Hickenbotham and Steve Russell, Ralph Baer actually had patented his idea for playing the video of ping pong. His patents predated the founding of Atari by a couple of years. Bushnell never applied for a patent for pong, and didn't have a case for proving that he invented it. And even if he did, he didn't have a chance to find a big corporation like Magnavox in court. So why did Atari become the symbol with video games instead of Magnavox? Short answer, it was skillful strategic maneuvering by Bushnell. Since he couldn't win in court, Bushnell paid a flat fee of 700000 for a license to use Bears patents. That means Atari bought the rights free and clear and would never have to pay a penny in royalties to Magnavox. And because Magnavox was now the undisputed patent holder, they had to sue. Atari's competitors in core, whenever competing game systems and the pens, Atari didn't have to chip in for the legal fees. Magnavox had Odyssey on the market while Atari was still years away from manufacturing a home version of Pong. But Magnavox wouldn't capitalize on their exclusive market. Their first mistake was selling the product exclusively through their own network of dealers, when it would have been smarter to sell them in huge chain stores like Sears and Kmart. Their second mistake was implying in their advertising that Odyssey would only work with Magnavox TVs. That wasn't true, but the company was hoping to increase TV sales. All they ended up doing was hurting sales of Odyssey. In 1975, they discontinued the 12 game system and introduced a table tennis only home video game to compete against the home version of Pong. Then, in 1977, they introduced Odyssey 2 to compete against the Atari's 2600 system. Yet, in spite of all the effort, and in spite of all the fact that they, not Atari, owned the basic video game patents, Magnavox was never more than a Me Too product with a marginal market share. Magnavox finally halted production in 1983. As always, thanks for watching.